Thank you all very much for coming along this evening uh, on this very unpredictable day weather-wise. I don't know if anyone else managed to get completely soaked, but I certainly did. Um, yes, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to, to be here today and especially uh, to speak um, about the work of Yinga, which we'll do in the exhibition um, mostly after my uh, presentation here, and also, also to speak uh, on the work um, around... Um, her own particular area, her particular field, looking at the area of uh, smart materials, looking at wearable technology, and, and really uh, exploring a little of where that's come from and uh, what's, what is the background to what we're, we're seeing in the exhibition today. So I'd like to start off just with uh, a little bit of an introduction to, uh, to myself. As Susan said, I work as an academic and also as a, a consultant, and Pretty much all of my work relates to the impact of technology on textiles. It looks at uh, what textiles are, how they perform, what they look like, how they're being used, reused, um, and how the design using textiles has changed really as a result of technology. Um, these are some of the books that I, I've written or contributed chapters to uh, that include the Cyborg Command Machine uh, over there on the top right. And uh, then the most recent that I've contributed to is this Digital Revolution exhibition, which is just opened at the Barbican ex uh, Gallery in London and will be touring. Let's hope it comes to Toronto. Um, so the the cyborg is, is something that's really... Re um, been a field that I've been interested in for, for quite some time, really since the early 1990s, and really going beyond how textiles use technology to why we're wanting to use them. So really, I guess the first question that I wanted to pose tonight is, is looking at what is the motivation behind smart materials and wearable technology? Is it just about the latest gimmick? Is it just about the latest aesthetic? Um, <laughs> Or is it something that is more deeply ingrained in, in our human psyche? And to me, really, it, it goes far beyond the technology, what we can do, which is really a sort of passing thing. It, it changes. It's a very ephemeral thing. Um, and I believe it, it's really uh, firmly uh, embedded in who we are as humans as we, we look over the years, over the centuries, at how we can enhance, extend our lives, and even to the point of ultimately uh, living forever and the quest for eternal life through different means, whether they're alchemy, whether it's through mythology. Uh, and if we look back over the years, um, this is an illustration from um, the 17th century from Fortunio Lysetis. And this is from his Demonstrous book. And this is looking at, at, at humans, but humans transformed. And in those days, it was transformed through giving them animal or bird heads. It was also a, an exploration of, of the unknown. So a lot of these um, images, um, the medieval bestiaries, were based on writing and text from explorers like Marco Polo. And it was imagining what might happen if you combined some of these different animal attributes and, and gave a human, for instance, in the far right there, scaly skin. And these were also based on medical Ill ailments of the time as well, and where you did have, uh, the, as he was called, the fish boy of Naples, who had the scaly skin. And what was that like? How would that be transferred over to the human? So, so what happens when you start playing around with the human being? Pre-technology... Um, an exploration of enhancing and extending the human and what that might result in. Would it be something that's quite monstrous or is it something that would be to the benefit of humankind? Uh, furthering that exploration and moving along here to uh, the 17th century with uh, Joseph Merrick. This is one of the last very sad photographs uh, of him before he died. And in those days, very sadly, what was, what was happening was anybody who did have medical deformities or was in any way different was actually taken around as a touring circus, pretty much. And a lot of people like Merrick were actually toured until they died because people would handle them 
and they were very roughly treated in this um, traveling uh, circus. So you had these awful things happening, but then it's now serving as inspiration for fashion design, and on our right here, we've got the Belgian designer, Walter van Beerendonk, who's taking some of these ideas and the aesthetics and the visual and applying it to fashion, so taking it and doing something new with uh, with the visual aspect, not with with the concept, not with the, the actual um, idea of what it was like to be Merrick, to, to live in that body, but looking purely on a visual side of things. But we've moved forward to modern science, and a lot of this served to make people afraid of science, and people afraid of technology. And a lot of the engravings that you found as science started to come in were, uh, were quite scary. And it, it, it was looking at science as something that was a negative, something that would uh, bring about the downfall of humankind. Um, so part of what science had to contend with back in the 19th century and is still contending with today is human perception. What is our perception? And influencing that are, um, is, is science fiction, is popular imagery, much in the way that the medieval bestiaries would have influenced people's idea of what modern medicine was about, what uh, altering the human state was about. So here, this is Amy Mullins, a double amputee, and she's wearing, down here, she's wearing not a regular prosthesis, but she's wearing something called sprint light, which is a textile, I'm happy to say. Uh, but it's, uh, it's made of carbon fiber, so it's extremely lightweight, uh, it's very, very strong, and the design has been based on something called biomimetics or biomimicry. So it's extracted from nature. It's looking at the hind legs of the cheetah, the fastest known animal. And this is used simply for, uh, for running. She has other prosthesis, which she uses every day. So she has, for instance, another pair of uh, um, lower leg prosthesis, which match her skin tone. So the silicone rubber of those matches her skin tone. And it's even got little hair follicles around the ankle, so it looks more human-like. And the heel has been done to, I think it's a three-inch heel she's got. So she can go into a regular shoe store and buy regular shoes with that height of heel. It doesn't have to be a, um, something that isn't very, very beautiful. But these are for speed. But this is, is quite a shift in our thinking to think of, wow, that looks very different to a human leg. Can it be faster? And for the amputee, it is. So we're now seeing these in the Paralympics um, quite regularly. Um, and looking at, at, at modern science and how that extends our lives, uh, we see textiles coming in here in terms of um, uh, how they're used. And, and this is from researchers in Sweden at the, the Swedish School of Textiles in Boros. And what you're looking at here, you can see the scale is quite massive, <laughs> the scale, but it's actually uh, in a tiny little jar. And what you're looking at here, um, does anyone want to guess what that is? Guessing time, just checking everybody's uh, on the edge of their seats here. Maz, you might have heard it before in another talk, so don't say if, you, if I've included it in one of my OCAD talks. <laughs> Sorry, Maz is one of my graduates from last year. Or maybe I should quiz you just to make sure you were listening to the earlier talk. No thoughts? Okay, it's, um, uh, it's a medical stent, and it's been embroidered. So embroidery, if we're looking in the, the museum here, we'll see a, a lot of beautiful and exquisite embroidery, but a lot of the embroidery is used for decorative purposes. And that's what we, and, and people outside of the textile community, generally think of in terms of textiles. We don't tend to think of them as something which is performance or technology driven, and yet it can be. So something like this, it uses a textile because of its biocompatibility and its lightness. It can also be stitched in a way that it can be removed, and we'll see an example of that later on. Uh, it can be removed in a, a very unobtrusive way from, from the body. But this is a medical stent um, here, and it can be... Um, Depending on the, the substrate that's used, it can be water-soluble, so it can disintegrate over time within the body. So extending our lives, 
But what about going further? Um, name that movie? This is Tron Legacy. Um, I prefer the original Tron, but hey, that's me. Um, uh, so this is, uh, this is looking at the Tron Legacy. So the idea of, of uploading and downloading and what do we do with our bodies? Is it enough that we simply enhance our lives and, and medically enable ourselves to live a little bit longer? Or do we want to defy death? If we look back at the early alchemists and early mythology, it was all about that. It was all about how can we defy it? The early alchemists consuming mercury didn't go down very well um, and actually hastened the emperor's uh, demise. But medical science is now pushing things along and, and we can extend our lives. And do we want to live forever? Do we want to, as in the case of Tron, have our brains within the machine? So we get away from these fragile bodies we're all in, um, and we simply exist in, in here. Um, being the textile spot I am, I was looking earlier at the, the top right-hand shoulder, and I saw a nice spacer fabric there. So still, even in the machine, you can see the spacer fabrics, you can see the technology fabrics. Um, one of the, the scariest and most interesting um, uh, views of uploading is from um, Hans Moravec. And he has been uh, looking at this, and he's written a book called The Mind Children, The Future of Robot uh, and AI. And, uh, and he goes into great detail about how one could actually do that, how one could actually down, or rather upload one's brain onto the uh, computer and defy death. He hasn't tried it himself, interestingly enough, and I don't think it's, it's one to try at home. Anyway, there we are, future looking where we where we're going with this what what we want to do with it and why so um coming back uh closer to um to Yin Gao's work and uh what she's doing now is um a lot of what what she's working with are, are smart materials but what is a smart material so a smart material is really something that senses and responds to changes in its environment um, the example that you're looking at here, this is where you've, uh, you've got um, uh, buttons that you can press and proximity so that lights come on uh, with, uh, with proximity. And they're, they're starting to be used in a whole bunch of uh, different applications from clothing to product to, to architecture. And textiles are very, very important to this because textiles are flexible. If you think of embedding sensors or embedding technologies that have to change and respond into concrete, that's a very hard material. It's a very inflexible material. It's not very accommodating for, uh, for these kind of changes. Uh, but textiles are by their nature. So textiles are super as a conduit. Um, and we're starting to see more inherently smart textiles, but mostly they're there as a conduit for other technologies. Um, in terms of how they're being used, they're, they're, using, they're being used for a variety of different functions, and these are driving the developments of the technologies. Uh, and the technologies can range from um, computer technologies to sensors, uh, to piezoelectric wires, um, to um, health-giving um, uh, qualities. And this is one of those health-giving ones. This is from HT Concept. And this uses a ceramic technology that's been uh, encapsulated into the fabric. And what this does is it captures um, heat from the body and then it reflects it back to your body. And uh, what this does is it re-energizes you. Uh, the uh, developers of this were looking at it particularly for people recovering from illnesses um, and for elderly people as well who have problems with circulation. And it was a very strange one because when I, I came across this at a, a trade show, that, uh, very good in terms of technical textiles, the Tech Textile trade show in, in Frankfurt every two years. Um, and I was a bit suspicious about this. And they said, no, no, try it. And it was weird. It really did work. And I thought, wow, this is, this is quite awesome. So, um, so this is an interesting one. And you can see from the image here that the drape and the fold is, is very soft. And this is where, as I say, textiles really come into their own. They have that softness, that flexibility, because ceramic it is quite a brittle material. 
it's uh, it generally on its own it's a hard material and not something you would want to wear next to the skin so we're seeing hybrid materials come in here we're also seeing technology and wearable technology come into the luxury arena Partly because of cost, uh, it, it costs a lot to develop these things, to make them, uh, to produce them. So the luxury is where you can ask, ask that extra uh, price point. Uh, what we're seeing here is uh, a fabric from Scabal in uh, Belgium. Um, and this is a lapis lazuli fabric. And uh, this incorporates tiny gr um, ground uh, powdered lapis lazuli into the fabric. So you've got this kind of bluish tinge to the fabric, uh, which is, is also wool. And this also has health-giving properties. It's supposed to be very good traditionally in homeopathic remedies for, um, for sore throats. And if you've got any respiratory problems, this is supposed to be very good. So this is a very high-end, expensive fabric. It's not something you're going to see down at the local winner's store. It's, uh, they sell suits to people like Barack Obama. Um, they also do other suits which have got um, diamond, tiny diamonds, um, in, um, incorporated into them, but no health-giving properties there. So the health and well-being area is a key driver for the development of these technologies because there is, uh, there is funding there and particularly as we've seen uh, a lot of military funding being, uh, being depleted since the end of the Cold War, um, uh, a lot of these technologies are coming from healthcare and well-being, which is good to see. Um, Another factor on uh, smart materials it goes beyond the actual technologies to smartness in, in terms of design and looking to nature in particular in biomimicry or biomimetics. So this is going looking to nature beyond uh, the, the, the visual appearance and uh, looking at the structure. So um, an example of this would be Velcro. Um, where you've got your hook and fasten system that was inspired by nature. And then more recently, this is from Scholler, and this is a, a sea change coating uh, for a fabric. And this is based on the, the fur cone that opens and closes and can uh, entrap uh, more air, which of course is our best insulator. Um, if you think of, uh, if you've got hairs on your arm, like I have, um, if it's cold weather outside, the hairs automatically start rising to trap in some, some air and keep me a little bit warmer. It doesn't quite work in the Toronto winters, but it all helps. Um, and then this is what I was referring to earlier in terms of smart design. So this again is from the, the Swedish School of Textiles in, in Boros. Um, and this is a, a, another medical stent. And this is knitted, a knitted structure. And you can see with the um, material coming down here, uh, the uh, thread, if you pull this, once you put it inside the body, it, when you need to remove it, rather than have to undergo very invasive surgery, what you can do is take the thread and literally unravel it out of the body. So you're talking about keyhole surgery rather than a very invasive surgery where you're under anesthetic for several hours, for instance. So... I guess the, the thing with this is, is really to say that it's not enough to have a, a smart technology um, and a, a great technology. You have to have smart design as well. Without the design and the smartness in design, um, really the technology will just be used as something that's quite disposable and uh, quite gimmicky, as we've seen back in the, the late 80s with those thermochromic t-shirts that responded to heat and anybody wearing them just had sort of very very warm and, and discolored underarm areas um, and uh, it, it didn't last very long. So without smart design that's what we end up with. So we need the smartness of design and, and um, that's hugely important. So wearable technology where, where has this come from and, and, and where are we going with this? This is a, an image from an exhibition that I curated um, in 1999-2000 for the Stedelijk Museum um, in Amsterdam. Um, and this was looking at the cyborg, the enhanced human. 
And they wanted me to look at, at what was happening in terms of technology and also where it had come from. And it, ultimately, the exhibition ended up as the basis for the, the Thames and Hudson book that I wrote. Uh, and this is the main room that we had here. Has anyone seen a very bad B-movie called Coma? Anyone seen that? There's one hand. Do you remember the scene where there were all the bodies were hanging uh, in, in an induced coma. That's what I was thinking of with the exhibition design for this because all around this room, there were all these big windows and all the trams used to stop outside. So I really wanted these suspended bodies hanging there so people in the trams could sit in the trams and just see these hanging bodies as they, they sat there. Um, so yeah, coma. In the absence of a budget, <laughs> because the, the other exhibition on at the museum at that time, as I discovered, was Bill Viola. So he got the budget. I got the rooms. So I had about seven rooms, but he had the budget. So anyway, in the absence of a budget, this is what we ended up with. Um, anyway, it was it was fine. I was uh, very happy with it. But we, uh, some of the work here, the um, uh, you can see it. It was all happening at a very early stage, and it was at that point really lacking in a significant power supply. So it was very difficult to really get beyond the basics in design terms until the design until the power supply was was worked out you were talking about big clunky batteries that didn't last very long and and not very wearable so ultimately this is a, a typical design of the time this is from Steve Mann um, and this is what he, he was using in 99-2000 and this was what you're looking at here was a, it was a helmet with antenna on top that used to break every time he went through a doorway. Um, and then this was powered by a Pentium PC in this backpack. So it, really to say it was wearable technology, it wasn't really wearable. It was what was on his desk, put into a backpack and on his head and, and carried around with him. So that to me is not very wearable. When it's wearable is when you can throw it in the washing machine and go. And that's where we're looking to get to. But this is where we were at, and this is state of the art for, for that period. This was uh, an, a, um, a work that I was involved with as a consultant. Um, and this is for the British fashion designer, Hussein Shalayan. And he wanted to make a dress that would, um, that would change shape. And he had the idea of using a, um, some magnets. And I said, well, Magnets are very difficult to control, so um, what about these memory metals or shaped memory alloys? And these are materials that are nickel and titanium, and they change at different temperatures. So because they change at different temperatures, they can change their shape. So they're said to have a memorized shape. Uh, at that stage, you had wires, you had you had metal sheet, but it wasn't very powerful, so you couldn't use it. You were starting to see polymers coming into play on this. But again, uh, they were quite brittle after just a few uses, um, and they were really just in Japan. The, the Japanese companies were using them for Barbie doll hair. Um, and that didn't really go anywhere. So I've got a short video. I'm just going to take my technology in hand, and if you'll bear with me for a moment, I'll see if I can relatively seamlessly um, show you this video. Um, here we go. No, it doesn't want to do that. Okay. Um, maybe we'll come back to the video at the end and have a look at that. It was a video of Erin um, O'Connor wearing this coming out on stage and showing her being literally plugged in um, to this. And when we had the dress, uh, which is using the memory metal, and we we put some in some of the wire into the fabric and it worked and we thought that's terrific and then we scaled it up to size and it went all over the place it looked like a terrible daffodil um, and Hussein was looking and saying no this isn't quite and I said I know I know not quite what you had in mind and then I remembered a lovely origami scarf that I had in my collection uh, from Nuno and it's a beautiful very simple design, clever design, uh, which is based on origami and it's a polyester, 
which of course is a thermoplastic and can be permanently heat treated. So she had folded this up with paper so that it lay flat. But if you catch both ends and then pull it apart, it just springs up into this beautiful, uh, beautiful scarf and uh, as a much bigger scale. Uh, incidentally, she's got to show up um, in um, Mississippi. Mississippi. Thank you very much. And do, if you can go to see it, do go and see it. It's, I, I looked at Google Maps how long it would take me to drive, and uh, my, my heart sank. But do go and see it. it it's a very special designers. So I took her, uh, her scarf as a basic idea, and then I did the zigzag with the wire. And that worked, because it, uh, it expanded uh, at a much greater degree, because it, it would go in quite small, and then it would come out quite large. And because the wire on its own only expands by um, 8%, which you can't see in an auditorium of you know, 2,000 people. So we ended up with 45 meters of wire in this, uh, which was fine. And we gave Erin O'Connor a little uh, garter to put around her leg, which she was unimpressed by, as she realized it was just in case any power went through her heart and this would mean she'd live. Yeah. That's why she's not looking very happy in this. Um, so, and then Hussein said, maybe she could have a power supply that she could press on her hand, and then that would cause the dress to open up. Um, and I said, well, if she can uh, carry on a car battery, then we can do that, because at that stage, that's what it would take to have this power up really quickly. So the car battery was off stage. It became part of the performance that somebody would come on, plug her in, come off again, and then the dress opened up, as you're seeing over there on the right. Then she was unplugged and left the stage. So it was all a bit scary um, sitting in, in the audience in case something fused or, or blew or nothing happened. Um, I, I wasn't sure what was worse, but, oh, yeah. Pure relief. Um, so anyway, so that was that was that piece here. This is uh, one of the original wearable technology group from uh, MIT, Maggie Orth, um, and this is her switch switch technology. And it's uh, it's roughly the scale you're seeing it he at here, uh, slightly smaller, maybe about a, a fifth smaller um, than that. And it's a series of panels. Uh, so each one was this size here. And what she was using were um, uh, was the thermochromic inks, so they were responding to heat. And then she was using um, uh, fiber optics so that you could either have it on a proximity switch, so as you went close to the wall hanging, it would start changing its color and its pattern, or you could have it on a, a timer loop so that it went round in a... Um, in, in a cycle, taking about uh, two and a half minutes for it to run through a full cycle uh, when it was um, being run. And very beautiful and, and pattern constantly changing. And I exhibited this in a show I did for the Industrial Fabrics Association International. Uh, and Maggie very kindly shipped this over and I took it out of its crate. And when I took it out of its crate, this is what I found. And I went and had a strong coffee when I saw this because um, it's, uh, there are a lot of wires. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it was scary every morning to, uh, to switch it on. It, it worked, um, and we had it running every day, but it was, it was scary to, to unpack and, and find this. But this is, this is where we've come from in, in terms of the technology. And I'm trying to remember the date on that exhibition. I think it was about uh, 2006, um, the date on that one. This was 2009. Um, this is uh, Rip Curl uh, wetsuits in Australia. And this is their H-bomb wetsuit, which keeps you warm. So the back of the wetsuit has got this um, heating element in it. And it was working on a lithium battery. So very small, about that size, lithium battery. And it, it would run for about uh, seven to nine hours. And very impressively, I thought, uh, was that it would not only work, it would work in water and in salt water. 
And that was pretty good. So when I saw this, I thought, right, we're now at the stage where we're getting the wearable technology, that it is being properly wearable, it is working, you can be very active out there on the surf, um, and it will work in water so you can um, really get on with it. And this is really what, what it has, has to be. It has to be this wearable. Um, this is from uh, another exhibition I curated, which is for the Science Gallery at Trinity College, Dublin. This is called Techno Threads. And this is a design by Quitz Campbell. And it's uh, this beautiful it's a 1950s dress. And um, the embroidery that you're seeing there, uh, just those very simple flowers, um, have got an electroluminescent cable in them. So it, it glows. It's difficult to see in, in this image and, and, and light very clearly, but it, it glows. And I like this as, as a reminder of the relationship between technology and craft, that we still need both of these coming hand in hand. We need that human element, that human touch um, in, uh, in the way we work with technology. Otherwise, we end up with a series of black boxes. And that, what we see downstairs with the work of Ying Gao is that beautiful bringing together of the, the technology, of the craft, um, to make something that is, is a very human um, garment and uh, a very warm garment to, to look at in, in, in human terms rather than simply a neat piece of technology. But how, what, what kind of challenges have we got in designing? One of them is, this is another show I was involved with at, at Science Gallery, looking at uh, magical materials. And, and one of the challenges that we have in terms of wearable technology is what you're seeing here uh, with, with Nanoman is, is a superhero. We've, we've, you know, we've seen all the Marvel comics, we've seen um, all these uh, amazingly um, enhanced humans that have got these terrific qualities. And that's kind of the expectation, is that that's what smart materials will deliver, that's what wearable technology will deliver. But is that reasonable? Or do we want that? Do we want to walk down the street looking like this? Maybe, maybe some people do, but, but not every day. Um, so how do we get away from this expectation in terms of what the technology is doing, or in, in terms of the aesthetic to a lesser extent? These were some of the technologies we included in the show. You've got the nickel titanium shaped mermaid metal and also soft batteries. So again, we're getting smaller and smaller here um, in terms of the size of technology, which is very important to the um, integration of that. But, but science fiction, and again, Ying Gao touches on this in one of her pieces that we'll see downstairs later on, is very important in terms of forming our opinions of... Um, clothing and technology developments. Um, looking back to the, the healthcare and human-centered design is a, a very big issue in terms of where we're going with the technology, with the usage of that. This is from AlphaFit, and this is a bed uh, where you have sensors included in the bed that are monitoring. On the screen that's, that's next to the bed, they monitor the position so that if somebody falls out of bed or if they've been in the same position for too long, they can start to monitor um, and send a carer in if somebody is needing help. So this is all moving towards the use of, of smart materials and smart design to allow people to have more independent lives for longer. Because you don't want to just live longer lives if your quality of life is, is hopeless and you're, you're in a care home for uh, 20 or 30 years or something. N nobody wants that. People want to live in their own homes or have more independent lives, and this is where a lot of this kind of technology is coming from. Uh, it's also starting to raise some issues about, uh, about privacy and data control, which we'll come to a little bit later on as well. Um, one of the terrific things that, that's enabling this, I've said that earlier that textiles are really a conduit for wearable technologies, um, and this is a nice example of that. This is from uh, one of a series of embroidery machines, um, and this is from ZSK. Um, and what you're looking at here is a, a, a non-woven fabric. Uh, so non-woven is where you've got different fibers overlaid on each other, um, in a, a fairly random matrix and then bound together 
maybe with stitching or with heat or with water or a combination. Um, and then stitched over it is a conductive yarn. Um, and this, I stood it and, and watched whilst this is being done. And this took, um, it took about uh, three minutes to do. So that, that's pretty impressive. That could then be incorporated into a jacket, into a piece of clothing, um, and then plugged in or whatever they're wanting to do with it. So this I saw um, in, uh, let me see, I think this was 2011. And then, uh, yeah, and then last year I went along, and this is the next iteration of that. So we're talking two years from that point. You're still getting the conductive yarn being stitched in, but what they were now doing, and this is a, a TITV uh, research institute in, in Europe, uh, what they were now doing is as it was being stitched, they were soldering on the LEDs with a little robot arm as it went. So all of this was happening at the same time. So I was hugely, hugely impressed. And next year, the trade show will be on, and I'm going to go along, and I want to see what they're doing then. Um, because it's, uh, it, it's the, the pace of technology. It used to take, say, 10, 15 years before technology would be introduced by NASA and then become uh, useful in a consumer product because of, of the time lag, because of um, uh, cost, various things. And now we're just seeing everything um, speeding up very, very quickly. Um, and this is um, from ITA um, in, uh, in Germany. And this is a... a uh, the type of use that a technology like that will be put to. Oops, oh, we've lost, we've lost our image. No, I don't want an update. Sorry. Ah, phew. Okay. <laughs> so, as I was saying, so. This is the use of, typical use of that type of technology. So this is a, a, a T-shirt with sensors embedded into it. So this would monitor a patient in their own home or as they're moving around, recovering or long-term care. Uh, so monitor their vital statistics and send that data to their caregiver uh, or medical practitioner um, and send that through, which is terrific. But it does start to raise um, questions about privacy and about data control. Um, so, for instance, what happens if um, the patient's insurer um, gets hold of this um, information and says, gosh, you know, I'm, I'm insuring this person and they're not doing uh, all the exercise that their uh, medical practitioner told them they had to do in order to be well and, and healthy, so I'm not going to insure them anymore or I'm going to increase their premium because they're looking a bit unhealthy here and, and, and I think they're going to be going back into hospital and that's going to cost me or maybe I'm not going to insure them at all. So what happens at data? How is it, who owns that? How is that being used? Um, uh, and how is the privacy of the, the user being protected on that? Um, and this is starting to be a very big issue on, on wearable technology, as in other areas as well with, with the internet. And one of the people that, that's written um, very well on this is one of the people coming from MIT, uh, originally from um, the wearable technology group, um, uh, Alex Pentland, and he's got a new book out, but he's done also a, a white paper just on privacy and how we might look to manage privacy and data control um, and it is a, a growing area of discussion in this. So um, these are also coming on track in terms of technologies. These are conductive inks. So this is where uh, the ink has been printed on, in this case, onto paper, but could just as easily be textile. Um, and we're also seeing printable um, sensors as well. So from the thread to actually just printing there. So you, you might not necessarily have to see it unless you, you want to or you need to. And you can see it, it's plugged in here and it's, it's working. Um, and again, look at, at di uh, diagnostics. And, and increasingly here you've got a narrow weave that's uh, picking up on, on diagnostic material from the user just by the user's breath. 
So it's becoming more and more discreet, uh, more and more sophisticated. Um, and you can see in real time that was the data that was being picked up um, over there. And again, the, the privacy is, is coming into this. What happens? Because further down the line is picking up on breath. What happens if we don't know that it's picking up on our breath as we're moving into a room? Um, and our, our, will our data be monitored in a room like we're sitting now uh, without our knowing? So um, so where, where is, is this further down the line going to? Is it going from the personal to the um, really ubiquitous? Um, and it's, it's all around us. This is a graduate student from uh, OCAD University from the Digital Futures Program. Um, this is uh, Yushi Wang. And Yushi's concern was really to look at how we, we need to design using wearable technology. Because to her, we can't just uh, take our uh, existing approach to design and say, okay, well, well, I just take this shirt and I just stick on a bit of uh, wearable tech and, and that's it. You need to design in a different way. So she's been looking at how we can use deconstructivism so really taking apart our whole approach to pattern making and reassembling it so that it's creating spaces, literally, um, for the technology, in this case photovoltaic technology, to take in energy from the sun and convert that um, to, to power, that it can be used to power um, LEDs or other technologies. So how you can incorporate that and also create a, a greater level of user comfort so comfort has for many years uh, been ignored, to my mind, um, in terms of wearable technology because a lot was originally done for the military and in particular the SEALs in the US. So they were being told, uh, you wear this and it's another nine pounds, but, you know, the SEALs do what they're told and, and they just had no choice about it. Now it's becoming more of a consumer uh, driven product, suddenly people are starting to become aware of, of comfort and also acknowledging in healthcare and in sports industries that comfort is a performance factor. If somebody is comfortable, they will perform better. If somebody is comfortable, they will wear their medical device um, all the time. If they're not comfortable with it, they won't wear it so it won't be so effective. So comfort is a big issue um, and that needs to come into our, our whole design of these garments. Uh, this is from the exhibition that's just opened, as I, I mentioned earlier, in, in London at the Barbican Centre. Uh, the exhibition is called Digital uh, Revolution. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I did a, a catalogue essay for the catalogue. I've got a copy here if anyone wants to see it later. Um, um, and this is Cute Circuit, and this is a Twitter skirt. So this is where you can tweet and have your tweets showing up on, on your skirt um, so it really is wearing your phone on your, your sleeve and, and, and um, it becomes an aesthetic as well as um, an information source as well. And uh, this is uh, Yong Jung and uh, she's based over in doing research over in Eindhoven now and what she's been interested in looking at is in terms of how we wear clothing, how can our clothing actively uh, be used to contribute to our well-being? How can it actively uh, in, in imbue that quality with us? And so she's been incorporating technologies within her garments so that color and light um, can, uh, can respond to changes in the, in the wearer and um, in, give them a greater feeling of well-being or calm or de-stress, uh, depending on, on how they're feeling. And this is who we're going to be seeing shortly now, I'm just wrapping up here, um, Ying Gao, and this is her in certitudes activated by, by the viewer's voice. So it, it, we'll talk more about this in the exhibition, but one of the things that struck me when we were first starting to see mobile phones coming into play was I remember sitting in a restaurant and and there was a table next to me with four people around the table, and they're all on their mobile phones. They weren't talking to one another, they were talking to other people. And I thought, 
this is really sad. You know, people out there are supposed to go out and, and, and enjoy an evening together, but they're enjoying their evening with somebody else remotely. Um, so it struck me, we really have to get past this. And, and, and with, um, I remember with, with Steve Mann, when he, he did a, a workshop with me over in, in Amsterdam, at the Netherlands Design Institute, it, it was an issue when he was wearing one of his head-up display units, um, or his glasses with a camera on it, people couldn't make eye contact in his group. Um, and we had a huge and very interesting discussion about the importance of making eye contact, because nobody knew if he was uh, really making eye contact or speaking with them, they couldn't see behind the glasses, or if he was downloading information to his website or, or emailing somebody. Um, so technology can be a barrier, but it can also be a way of communicating. So this is one of the things that, that this dress does, is it actively communicates and responds to um, the other person in a way that's very visible to the wearer and the person that they're interacting with. Um, and then my final image on this is um, Playtime from Ying Gao. I was really pleased to see that one of her pieces was called Playtime and that it was inspired by the Jacques Tati film uh, from 1967, uh, that, which is the image that you see over there on the right. Um, and Jacques Tati is a wonderful filmmaker and uh, he's... A lot of his work, and this, this one in particular, is really about modern society um, and uh, the human surrounded by technology, surrounded by um, uh, all of these devices that are here to help us, but do they help us? And or do they blur the boundaries between what's real and what's unreal? So, for instance, in, in, the, uh, in the film, where you see the Eiffel Tower there next to the lady, you see all these landmarks of Paris, famous landmarks of Paris, but you never see them, the actual landmarks, you only ever see them reflected. And I thought that was quite a nice analogy with, with a lot of our experience of the world around us, although it's heightened by technology, the internet in particular, um, it's also distanced by that. Um, and we've got writers like Umberto Eco who've, who've written extensively um, on this, this hyper-real world that we're living in that technology is part of. But it is here. It is part of, of what we're doing, how we're living. So uh, I believe our, our role is, is deciding and uh, really actively becoming engaged with, with how that materializes. Um, the role of textiles, the role of design, the role of fashion, the role of technology, how they come together and actively engaging in that dialogue. And I think it's, it's really terrific and, and the museum are to be congratulated for, for having the work of Ying Gao here because it's a very difficult work technically to, to exhibit um, and to show it and it's been beautifully done downstairs. So. Um, I would like to thank you all for, for coming and uh, perhaps we can take some questions and then maybe move downstairs and look at some of, some of the work um, in the exhibition. Thank you very much.